The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and good morning. I'm Carly Rogers, CAPSA's Marketing and Education Manager. Welcome to the Processing of Copper Alloys and Applications webinar, sponsored by ABC Metals Incorporated. We're pleased to welcome back our special guest presenter, Jim Mickle, Manager, Technical Services for the Copper Development Association. Each year as CAPSA prepares for its service center training event, we partner with the CDA to present a lead-in training webinar. These webinars provide background context for the classroom style presentations and private mill tour that event attendees will receive on site. We're happy to partner with Jim and the CDA again this year to present today's webinar as context for the upcoming service center training event at Olin Brass next Wednesday, October 28th. Jim has worked in the metals and corrosion industries since 1973, including the copper and brass, zinc and steel industries. He's held positions in research and development, technical service, product development, market development, and sales and sales development, as well as um, operated his own metallurgical consulting business. He also taught metallurgy courses for ASM International for 10 years and joined the Copper Development Association in January 2007. Um, Jim will answer your questions at the conclusion of his presentation. If you've attended our webinars before, um, you kind of know the drill, but you've got a webinar toolbar on your screen. Uh, there is a questions tab that you can submit questions to. Um, while he will answer those at the end, uh, definitely if you think of a question during the presentation, go ahead and submit it, um, and then we will get them answered um, at, the, at the end of the presentation. Uh, as well, one hour after the presentation ends, you will receive a webinar survey. Um, once you've completed the survey, there will be a link to today's slides, so you'll get a copy of the slides. Uh, the webinar surveys are a great way for us to find out what kind of topics you want to learn about, um, if you have any suggested webinar speakers or anything like that. So uh, if you receive that email, please um, complete. It's a very brief survey. It'll take you just a couple of minutes. We're also recording today's webinar as we do all of CAPSA's webinars. Um, it will be available on CAPSA's website and our YouTube channel um, later, probably by uh, tomorrow or so. But um, I'll email everyone and let you all know whenever the recording is um, available, and then that way you can share it with anyone who wasn't able to join the call today. Uh, so without further ado, I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Jim Mickle. Thank you, Carly. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. We're talking about processing of copper alloys and applications. This is um, prior to, as Carly said, a tour next week of Olin Brass in East Alton, Illinois. Um, they are what I would class as a fairly typical casting and rolling operation in the brass industry. They have some special characteristics or product areas which I'll, I'll be highlighting in the latter end of the presentation. Uh, so let's uh, move into it. I've shown this slide and I've shown it once before. Uh, you won't see anything like this when you go to Olin or in any plant uh, these days. These are uh, drawings from uh, a, a, an Egyptian tomb or the Pharaoh's tomb. Uh, it shows processing in the ancient world of uh, probably gold where they're melting it over a fire and you should note the protective or lack of protective equipment these uh, individuals are um, involved with or wearing, not wearing. Uh, the content or development here, they melt it and then they pour it into small crucibles at the end may probably to be made into jewelry of some type or some ornamentation. Um, from that we come to today's processing scheme uh, which is much more elaborate and people wear protective equipment. So I wanted to go through a diagram called Copper Production and Recycling which is uh, courtesy of the International Copper Study Group. The, there's two, two different uh, 
slides that give the full diagram, but you start at the left here with the mine or the uh, mining of copper alloy or copper materials. You also have some scrap recycling that feeds into this. This goes into the refining and smelting operations where you end up with a refined copper material. Um, usually this is 99.99% uh, .99 pure copper that is coming out of the mine and refinery. These uh, uh, products, which are generally called cathode in the industry, are then sent to various fabricating operations. You have wire rod plants, wire mills, brass mills, foundries, other plants. But they don't only bring in cathode or pure copper. They bring in alloy ingot of various types, alloy metals, scrap that is fed in, around in various ways to make their products. So we're talking about brass mills here. They make sheet strip, plate, uh, tube, various other products. Those are called semis or semi-finished products. Once you go past the brass mill or the sheet mill, the product supply is then sent to the manufacturing operations where they can go into construction equipment or, or construction uh, items, um, electrical and electronic equipment, industrial equipment, transportation, consumer goods or general goods, um, and other uses. During these manufacturing processes, you end up with generating scrap of various types that are then recycled back in various ways. Finally, once you have finished products in your, from the manufacturing operations, you go into product use. That's called in the red box at the top, copper res reservoir in use. In other words, this includes the wiring in your car, in your house, the plumbing tube in your house, the uh, tube in your air conditioner, um, all those electronic operate, uh, applications, your phone, the, the uh, uh, phones at home, the computers, all those things are called the copper reservoir in use. Some of the, and okay, architectural applications are included, uh, copper roof, copper facades, copper alloy materials. Until those are considered not useful anymore, they are in use. And copper in those applications can last anywhere from a short period of time to like a copper roof can last 100, and 100 to 120 years. Uh, so things are not moved quickly all the time into end of life management or scrap, reuse, recycling. There are some product uses, they're abandoned, stored, reused, end of life products um, yet to be recycled. Um, some building wire is never pulled out, new wiring is put in, um, various other applications that are never recycled until a certain time. Then you go to the yellow boxes, end of life management, that's all recycling in various ways. I won't go through that right now. In mill processing, I'm going to go through an introduction casting, rolling, hot and cold, finishing, and packaging, and then most common alloys used or common alloy uses. Uh, and these will be skewed in, the, uh, in an effort to show you what is happening or what happens in Olin uh, and in the Olin Corporation overall. 
This is a schematic or stylized mill process flow for hot side processing. Um, hot metal is poured into a ladle and then a tundish. These are all metal handling, hot metal handling uh, pieces of equipment. You have a transition piece where it goes into um, then a casting or a nozzle series that pours into a mold. And then you come out through a uh, cooling area. The hot end then, uh, you roll things down, you cool it, and you upcoil. Upcoilers, and we'll talk about this a little more in detail in a couple moments. On the cold end, you take what was the output from the hot processing, you've let it cool down, you've um, processed it further so there's no oxides and uh, bad things on the outside of the metal. You bring it to another series of um, another section of the mill where you have what's called here big size strip. You roll that down in a variety of, of processes sometimes uh, with annealing in between in various places to get a middle-sized or medium-sized strip. And then uh, if it's really specialized, you go down to very small size strip or very thin strip. Uh, there are various heat treatments, uh, maybe at the end, or cleaning processes. You go to packing, uh, slitting, packing, transport, all very high stylized here. So what really happens in a mill? You trans it really is a transformation of various materials, scrap, pure metals, and additives, or alloying elements, into semi-finished products for industrial use. There are several steps in the processing. And the final product, alloy size, shape, is dictated by the ultimate customer or by the market dictating what is generally used. So we'll go into the hot processing area quickly. Furnace charges. And if you're lucky enough to be on the tour, uh, this will be explained to you. But a furnace charge includes both virgin metals, pure metals, and scrap. Pure metals are substantially pure metals from refineries. You have electrolytic copper cathode in uh, sheet, ingot bars, or ingot uh, various shapes. You have slab zinc. You have tin if you're making uh, uh, bronze, nickel, copper nickel. Other pure metal additions. Some of these additions are made as master alloys. They're easier to get in there, such as phosphorus. Scrap is used in many forms. You'll note this if you are, go to the mill and see what is happening. There's runaround scrap. There's scrap run, that means within the mill itself that is cut off to allow further processing in the mill. That's sent back to the uh, furnace. The customer scrap. Sometimes a customer is buying strip sheet. They stamp a lot of material into various forms, but there's a lot that isn't used. And it's not usable to make those parts anymore. They're, that's collected, sent back to the uh, mill and that's remelted. It's already alloyed, so it's fairly easy to work into the processing. Scrap merchants. These are scrap dealers. They are asked to bring various materials together to feed into the mill in the melting process. That's where all these things come from. 
there are several casting processes that take hot metal and turn it into usable strip sheet plate. One is a continuous slab casting operation. Uh, this is used in steel, copper, zinc, um, uh, stainless, a variety of other uh, uh, materials areas, very similar material uh, handling. The furnace or the melting furnace is up a stream a little bit of this ladle um, where the ladle receives hot metal from the furnace. It then takes it to the tundish, which is a last hot metal area where it, it, the flow is controlled into the mold at the upper end of this. And then, as you note, in the upper drive area, upper mold area, there's cooling sprays. And it's cooled progressively as you go vertically down. It is bent into a, um, so it can be taken out, straightened, and cut into lengths. More common in the copper industry is a vertical direct chill casting, or um, where they make slabs, or as we call in the copper industry, cake. You have charge buckets, additions, melting furnaces. You have a holding furnace, which they feed into. Each of the melting furnaces, if there's one, two, three, can alloy and then feed into the holding furnace. Then you have mold uh, system up at the top. And these newly cast slabs go down into a pit, which is filled with water. And this is called direct chill casting. Uh, you use a crane and uh, a certain mechanism to lift these slabs out when they're done. Here's a detail of the, of the pit with a bottom platform and starter block, the solid ingot. And liquid metal is poured in, and you have sprays at the top that cool it. Of course, it's chilled by the water in the pit as well. Uh, the length of the ingot or slab is dictated by how deep the pit is. I um, believe a lot of material cast at Olin is done this way. But there's a third method, horizontal continuous casting, where you have the basic furnace, um, charging bucket, and then you cast out of the side, essentially, of a holding furnace, these are special alloys, uh, not always uh, high volume, but need special handling. There are certain manufacturers that make special alloys that need this type of casting. So that's a very interesting um, third method. Well, what do you do with hot metal after you produce it? Well, you roll it. Well, the purpose of hot rolling is you want to get that cast metal, which is usually inches thick, and I'm talking five to eight inches thick most of the time, to a thinner cross section, that being about three-eighths to five-eighths inch thick, for feed into the cold rolling section of the mill. Hot rolling allows faster reductions because the metal's microstructure is weakened by the higher temperatures. The metal is red hot. You bring the slab or cake out of the uh, conditioning furnace and you start rolling it. Hot rolling interactions happen on a usually a four high a uh, reversing mill. So it usually takes an odd number of passes to get this material down from five to five to seven inches thick to the three-eighths to five-eighths 
output. And these are done in rapid succession. You don't want the metal to cool down. Essentially what you're doing is using the um, lack of structure in the metal because it's hot to aid in reduction very quickly. But as you roll it, the crystal structure in the metal is reformed during the hot rolling process. It's changed to a finer grain structure. You get elongated grains too in the direction of rolling. Well, in this process you need to do other things because this is done in atmosphere, ambient atmosphere. What happens to this, uh, let me back up, what happens to this coil as you roll it? Well, it oxidizes on the outside. It essentially turns black, a heavy black oxide usually. So you need other equipment uh, after it's uh, rolled those numerous times. Um, you usually use up coilers at the end. Coils the hot band for easier, easier handling. But immediately after the hot rolling and up coiling, and then you let it cool, you take that coil and you run it through what's called a surface miller or a surface grinder, which conditions the surface. It takes off all the uh, oxide layers on the outside produces a, a generally clean surface, mechanically clean surface, and for input into the cold end. This is very important. You don't want to roll in any oxides or, or bad things into the surface. So in cold processing, You've conditioned the surface, you've rolled it down to the like 3 8 to 5 8 inch thick. Here you provide final size and shape to the material. You're still at a wide width and in, in copper industry you're about 36, 38 inches wide max. You develop the proper temper. In other words, it's uh, soft to super spring temper and that's usually developed in your last pass in the cold end unless it's very soft and it could be developed in the annealing process. You develop good surface quality. You usually come out of the cold end with almost or very close to a mirror finish on the material. Surface quality is very important. Cold rolling processes are several. You have breakdown rolling. That's the beginning of the process. You start with the uh, material that's either 3 8 to 5 8 inch thick. And obviously, if you are, or if the customer is buying uh, 0.010 thick, you're a ways away, or even 0.32 which is fairly thick strip, but that's still a long ways away from 3 8 inch thick, 0.375. Intermediate rolling, after you do the breakdown rolling, you got intermediate rolling, and at any point along this way, the, ma the material could be slit down from uh, three, 36 inch wide or so into narrower coils for handling on the finish lines, sometimes 12 inch wide, sometimes 24 inch wide, a variety of things. Depends upon what the customer is ordering. Finish rolling, as I said, is to provide the ultimate final uh, size, shape, finish, temper of the material. So finish rolling is um, the, the final material processing and at the end 
That's what you get there is the temper that the customer is asking for. They want full hard, if they want three quarter hard, if they want spring, this is where it's developed. Up until this point, you've done a lot of work, the mill has done a lot of work in getting the material down with good structure inside, good uh, surface, um, but the temper has not been finished or determined, fully determined. Types of rolling mills here, there's a variety in the cold end. In the hot end, you usually just have what I have here is mill or B, a four high mill. It's usually a four high reversing mill in the hot end. In the cold end, you can have two high mills, four high mills, or a cluster mill. Um, often, two high mills are not used. Uh, not a good enough shape control on those mills. For breakdown, four high mills are used often. This is gives you uh, a lot of throughput, and and uh, a lot of material can go through these four high mills uh, very fairly quickly. Uh, for final rolling, finish rolling, shape best shape control, you many times use a cluster mill, or um, they're often called a Z mill or a Zenzimer mill. Zenzimer was the gentleman, that's his name, who developed this type of mill, therefore the Z mill. And a cluster mill can have, as it shows, very small work rolls that contact the surface of the metal with lots of backup rolls or backup series of rolls to make sure that the contact is even and well distributed, the surface is, uh, is properly impacted, and oftentimes the work rolls in a cluster mill, the final working uh, mill, are a mere finish. They're to impart a mere or very high quality finish to the metal at the final point. Here's a exploded view, if you will, of a cluster mill, a Z mill. I believe you will see this mill or this type of mill at Olin. In fact, I know you will. Annealing. Well, what do we do in annealing? Annealing, I often uh, use the analogy that annealing is like you being stressed all week, going out to the beach on the weekend and laying in the sun, and the heat relaxes you. Well, annealing is relaxing the metal. So how do you do that? There's two different ways, or two different general processes. One is bell annealing, and these are enclosed annealing systems where you stack coils of metal one on top of the other in a bit on a base then you have a cover that is put over that you have the uh, chamber then is evacuated of air and backfilled with an inert gas generally and the heat is brought up and it's cooked for a period of time, heated for a period of time, until all the metal in those coils is relaxed or annealed to the right point. You reverse the process then. You open it up carefully. You don't want to, and you cool it slowly. And then you bring the coils back out to be processed further. The other way is continuous strip annealing. Um, this is very, both of them take a lot of space. This is done on the fly. 
you take a coil, you run it out in long uh, loops. It goes through a certain section that has a, uh, an atmosphere around it, but it's also heated. Uh, th this has to have fairly thin strip to anneal quickly at, uh, in this process. Um, much of the copper alloy materials are uh, bell annealed. Well, what do we do after we anneal it? Well, we usually clean it before we finish and pack it, but it, packing uh, is the final thing, packing and shipping. Usually the material is, as shown here, 36 inch wide. It could be finished that wide. Um, in a large coil. The customer may not want a large coil. Um, in fact, most of the time they don't. Most strip is used at three inches or less in width as final usage. So you have to do some slitting. You have to break the material up into smaller bits, if you will, smaller coils. Uh, slitting does that. Stylized or schematically, slitting is done this way. You have upper and lower knives that impact the strip or the metal. The metal is broken or split into various small strips. Each of these strips are then coiled up into its own coil off of the slitting operation. Oftentimes at this point uh, there's lubricants put on for ease of slitting so that you don't get any tearing or other things like that. When these coils are finished you can have them burr up or burr down. You have to specify that on the order or your customer does. That has some significance when it's uh, the, the coil or the material is put into a stamping press. And the finished coils look like this when they're done and, and stacked, ready to be final packed. These days packing is a separate and very important part of the process. Um, a customer, downline customer, does not want to get material that is damaged in any way. It, uh, the material is packed very carefully. There's uh, wooden and paper and cardboard separators. The uh, impact of the uh, packing operation should be minimal on the shape, size, um, and physical characteristic of the material. In other words, it should arrive at its final destination ready to be used uh, entirely. And here's some final packed material. Happens to be an Olin. Amazing, but true. Um, now, this is the end of the discussion. And I went through the processing a little fast or relatively fast. Uh, one of the other webinars we gave uh, a few years ago had general processing in it. But Olin has some unusual areas of application that I'd like to discuss in this area, uses of copper alloys. Um, they like uh, men, most of the other mills, make a lot of 110 copper, which is basic copper. Basic copper, if you, uh, as you probably know, if somebody walks into a service center and asks for copper without specifying what alloy they want, they will get C110 copper. 
99.9 plus pure copper. Um, it's used in a wide variety of applications, uh, buildings, uh, roofing, gutters, flashing, uh, screening of various types, uh, building fronts, automotive applications or radiators these days primarily in heavy use applications like heavy duty trucks, um, off off-road equipment like uh, bulldozers and things have copper and brass radiators for heat transfer characteristics. It can be used in gaskets, electrical, bus bars for electrical application, wire, contacts at various points in electrical systems, radio parts, switches, terminals, hardware. You have ball floats, uh, cotter pins, nails, nails, obviously copper nails are used on copper roofs or downspouts, uh, copper for soldering or, or feed into soldering, tacks, miscellaneous, anodes. If you're going to plate something in copper, you get a big piece of copper material, you put it in a tank with the chemical apparatus, and you plate out the copper onto uh, other materials. We'll talk about one of those in a little bit. Um, kettles, pans, printing rolls, rotating bands of various types, uh, expansion plates, vats. Here's some. Talk about vats. Look at the bottom lower right. That's a distillation vat or a beer brewing vat, vats, copper cookware. Um, not necessarily the best to polish, but it's very good on conductivity. You have a, a copper wire, copper in electronics highlighted in the on the circuit board. You have copper screening on the upper center on various things, copper architecturally in the upper left and left center. In the very upper right, there's bus bar and bus bar connectors shown. In the far lower left is a copper uh, motor rotor. or It's a copper-infused electric motor rotor inside the motor, which has windings of copper wire. Very, very high-efficiency motor system. Those are uh, being called uh, on more and more for the high efficiency requirements that are being asked of today. But there are specialty coppers, and Olin does a good, um, has a series of these alloys. I only highlight a few here. Um, several alloys that are produced are C192. 194 and 195. Uh, these were all developed for electrical and electronic applications. They're finding other uses uh, in various other ways these days. These were developed for, as I say, electrical and electronic applications, connectors, uh, small springs, uh, switch parts, um, here's some um, examples. On the lower left and lower right, there's connectors of various types, and sizes, and designs. Obviously, a wire or a cable is fed into these things. They are then crimped around those, and the connector is connected to the other side. You'll find these in the back of your computer, in all kinds of electrical equipment, electronic equipment, switch equipment. Um, they're big, they're small, a wide variety of them. And as one of the illustrations in the lower left shows, they're progressively stamped out of strip. Sometimes the strip is plated with 
tin coating or other coatings. Sometimes it is bare and then coated other, at other, uh, in other ways at other times. Another use for these things are, are on computer on a, uh, computer modules, if you will, or chip carrying devices, electronic chips, uh, which are the computer brains. Uh, there's lots of these. I highlighted three of them in the bottom center, the upper left, and the upper right. These take your electronic computations from the micro world of the microprocessor to the macro world of you and me. They are in the back of your computer. They're in the back of a wide variety of devices. They're usually uh, encapsulated in various ways to protect the electronic chip or the brain from damage. And then they're plugged into a circuit board or a processor board of some type and soldered into place. Um, these have been made since way back in the 1970s. Um, LEDs are a variety of these. They're smaller, but LEDs, light emitting diodes, are part of this process as well. So these specialty alloys are utilized in their, that application. 260 brass is a very common alloy. Olin makes a lot of it. Cartridge brass is a common name for it. It's yellow in color or yellow golden color. It's used in grill work, uh, decorative hardware, radiators, heater cores and tanks, uh, flashlight um, shells and fittings, switches, reflectors, screw shells, eyelets, fasteners, grommets, finishing hardware, push plates, ammunition components, plumbing goods and accessories, uh, fasteners, pins, rivets, screws, springs. Another thing that ca uh, characterizes this particular alloy, it is the most used copper alloy in the world. Um, there are variants and or um, similar alloys worldwide. It is a relatively inexpensive alloy to produce compared to the rest of the alloy families. It has huge and wonderful property range because of the alloy characteristics and it's easy to process, relatively speaking. You add 30% zinc to copper to get cartridge brass. That's essentially it. What do you do with this material? You do almost everything with it. Uh, cartridge brass refers to a main use that has been years, used for uh, a low on a century, and that's uh, ammunition cartridges, which like on the lower right. Um, those happen to be military rounds, uh, but civilian rounds also have brass cartridges. But you look at all these other applications, you put, uh, kick plates on your front door, uh, entry sets on your front door, uh, decorative hardware of all types, inside, outside, uh, railings, 260 brass railings in uh, various settings, grills, and uh, plumbing hardware, screws, bolts, attachment fittings, even some lamps, lamp bases, and in every switch and outlet, or most switches and outlets in your walls at home, you have 260 brass uh, pieces in there. You, and it's hidden. You don't notice it. Another alloy that is used by or produced by Olin in reasonably uh, reasonable quantity is copper nickel materials. I'm uh, illustrating here 706, which is 90% copper, 10% nickel. 
its usage is primarily uh, seawater use, um, seawater corrosion resistant. But there are other uses, and they're growing. So you use this for condensers, condenser plates, distiller tubes, desalination plants, uh, pipes and tubes on uh, military naval shipping, merchant marine shipping, things like that. Um, heat exchangers and screening uh, at coastal energy plants where you are trying to get uh, heat exchange and uh, corrosion resistance all put together. Here are some of the uh, illustrations. Um, up in the right is a ship, uh, actual uh, drilling ship that is going out into probably the North, uh, North Sea off of England. Um, you have in the bottom center fittings, fixtures, uh, tubes that are used in desalination or other applications. You have a desalination plant in the upper center. You have some fabrication going on in the lower right. But a surprising new use, and I'll touch on this later, is the antimicrobial area. There's a push plate uh, switch system that is copper nickel 706 and a railing system that isn't 706 but it's a uh, copper nickel material. Another thing that Olin does and other places don't is make coinage for the US Mint. Those, and I'll uh, point out that the silver colored US coinage is C713 alloy, 75 copper, 25 nickel, and it is silver in color. So all that coin that you're carrying around is copper. Uh, funny, but the pennies are copper plated zinc. <laughs> Hate to say that. Uh, and you'll note on these, the coinage on the dimes, quarters, and even half dollars, which are not illustrated, are what's called a sandwich coin or a three-layer coin. The center of layer is copper. The outside surface is C713, copper nickel. All of this coinage is antimicrobial. How is this made? Coinage for the US Mint. You have to do cladding. This is a roll bonding process where you essentially cold weld several layers of metal, sheet metal, into a final material. This illustration, which is the best one I could find on short, uh, putting this together, is showing two sheets being rolled together. In the US Mint coinage, there are three sheets that are rolled together to make the coinage uh, materials. You have the two outer sheets that are copper nickel and the inner one which is copper. Um, very interesting process, very specialized process. Um, they will talk about it, but they will not at Olin show this to you. So anyway, they also produce tubing, believe it or not. Tubing from strip. Olin Brass makes tube at their fine weld tube division in Cuba, Missouri. Um, those who are participating in the tour are going to East Alton, Illinois, which is just across the river from St. Louis, Missouri. The, um, that facility makes the strip and slits it, packs it, ships it to Cuba, Missouri, where it is then um, unpacked, put on a line, and uh, formed and welded, such as you're seeing here, 
into a tube, which is then further processed down line to the right size. And then those tubes are cut to the right length, coiled, whatever, and supplied to their customers. I can say that 706 copper nickel is provided to the marine usage area. There's other tubing made for heat exchangers, for uh, applications such as, and you, you saw a brass tube which was used as handrail. Uh, that's very common. So there's lots of things that are done with copper and copper alloy materials. Um, I do not know how many alloys they produce in, or produce as tube. Uh, that could be one of the questions. They also make nickel silver which is uh, an alloy of copper, zinc, and nickel that is silver in color. That's why it, it's a misnomer, basically. This is produced as all kinds of different hardware, um, zippers, rivets, screws, uh, miscellaneous camera parts, temples for frame, for uh, uh, your uh, eyeglasses, uh, bases for silver plate, costume jewelry, etching stock, hollowware, name plates. Um, in the Art Deco era back in the 1920s, 1930s, it was used in on the interior of many fancy buildings, such as the Chrysler Building here in New York City on uh, primarily elevator banks or interior trim. Interesting. Here's some uses. And there's a whole family of these alloys. I just highlight 752. Um, there's a wide variety of these alloys. In, you'll note in the center there's a coronet, a trumpet a variant that is a white musical instrument, white color, silver color. Um, so when you see one of those, it's nickel silver. On a clarinet, all those fittings and fixtures are nickel silver. The last area I want to touch on and is antimicrobial copper. And Cuvero is the Olin trade name for their antimicrobial copper materials produced. Okay, they are involved in this project, which was started by Copper Development Association some 15 years ago and has grown in, in uh, development and usage. Uh, it is increasing in applications, in, uh, primarily in healthcare, but not necessarily there only. You'll see a lot of applications uh, shown here. You have sinks and faucets, specifically faucet handles. You have in the lower center exercise equipment that has copper or copper nickel handles or uh, grips. Uh, those are being increased in use. It's antimicrobial. It kills the bugs, bad things. Um, and that's helpful in that setting, in the, as well as in a healthcare setting. Uh, Cross Pen Company makes pens out of copper nickel barrels, as you see in the lower center. There's lots of door hardware, uh, 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 hardware for hospitals, applications such as that. There's the uh, light switches, lower right. Computer keyboards, not so numerous, but produced. So look for these things, uh, discuss them, and I better get off because we're very much close to being out of time. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, we, ha we have some questions, so we've got a little bit of time here to take um, a couple of these questions. Let me 
make it a little bit bigger here so I can read them. Okay, uh, first question. Where the final chemistry and temperature adjustments are done before sending ladle to casting? We might need clarification if that doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, I, I understand the question. Okay. Where is the final chemistry determined of the alloy that is being manufactured? That's a very important question. Uh, when you have it in the main melt furnace, um, there are um, uh, you take a, a, a small little pot and you dip out some metal and pour it in to make pins uh, about two, three inches long by uh, half inch thick, half inch round or something. Uh, varying sizes at various mills. Okay, that's sent to the chemistry laboratory. They do an analysis. Okay, this is done several times before that material is poured. Um, first, they melt everything when it comes in. They find out what the chemistry is after they stir that pot up, and what they need to add to make it the right chemistry. Then they add what they think they need, and then they check it again. And then they, if, if it's still off, they add a little bit more. But before it's poured into final slab, um, it is determined that it is the, meets the right chemistry, chemistry characteristics for that alloy. It is in the range. They don't want all that metal to go to waste, <laughs> so that's what they do. Um, they try to do that as efficiently as possible, but that's the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, what is the difference between Z-mill and cluster mill? Uh, well, cluster mills are made by a variety of manufacturers. Mr. Zenzimer had his own manufacturing operation at one time, I believe. Uh, I believe he's dead, however. Um, a Zenzimer mill, uh, Mr. Zenzimer invented the cluster mill, I believe. Um, so they're one and the same. They're not different, really. There might be some slight variations in um, design. Uh, number of uh, there's usually just one set of work rolls, but the number of backup rolls may vary depending upon what you want. But they're really one and the same. Uh, a cluster mill these days is what was called a Z mill or Zenzimer mill in the past. That's where the origin was. We didn't always have those mills. They they've made the uh, the material. Uh, properties and shape, final shape, much better. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, next question. What are the common defects what are the common defects of cast or as rolled pro oh, okay, let's see here. What are the common defects of as cast and or as rolled product? Well you're looking at uh, sort of two different areas. Uh, in the casting um, one of the biggest problems uh, is that uh, the chemistry, as we talked about just a little bit ago, is off, and nobody knew that. Or, and that's called, oh my, or um, various other comments can be made at that point. Uh, everything, uh, there's a huge amount of effort that is done so that doesn't happen. Uh, but in the casting process, if there's too much oxide that's left in the material inside, um, uh, it's not uh, processed properly. If there's uh, other things, tramp materials that get in there, uh, then you just don't have a good material. When that happens, and uh, there's 
it's not off chemistry, but there's other inclusions or things that are in the melt or in the material. Oftentimes, that's reports into the uh, cold rolling operation and so forth. If these are non-metallic inclusions, they do not roll as a metal does. They do not elongate. They do not uh, squish you know, when you roll something. Uh, they basically get um, stay the same size, and as you make the strips thinner, they get they seem to get bigger. They can cause problems. Every effort is made um, in the hot end to not have that. Um, I have one slide which I didn't include in this uh, application. I, G I G O. Garbage in, garbage out. Um, if you have issues or put bad things into the metal, bad things will come out the other end. You may not be able to process it. Or you may have to use it for an intermediate or a larger gauge material than you had originally planned. Like an 032 instead of a 005 gauge foil because of these inclusions. Um, so that is determined as the processing is uh, moved forward. There are samples of the material taken as you're going through the processing stages to see what's going on. That's part of the quality control program. And I'm sure Olin will talk about that. They have a very good uh, quality control program at Olin. And I'm sure they'll speak to that. Okay. I hope I've answered that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. And I think we had a couple of other questions, but we're kind of going over the hour a little bit. So if um, anyone has further questions that they want answered, hasn't um, gotten an answer to, then feel free to email me. I know that Jim's email is up here on the screen for you, um, but he's traveling uh, next week, and so I'm going to kind of filter some questions for him. So uh, if you want to email me any questions that you have that didn't get answered on the call, feel free to do that. It is C Rogers, that's C R O D G E R S, at copper, C O P P E R hyphen brass dot org. Um, I'll also put my email in uh, my email address in the email follow up email I send you guys with the recorded link and, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, and I believe it should be in the email actually when you get the survey email here in about an hour. Uh, my email address will be in there as well. So I apologize if your question um, didn't get answered, but we are kind of going that over the hour a little bit here. We want to um, keep it to an hour if we can. So thank you, Jim. Appreciate your time again helping us with this um, webinar presentation leading into our Olin Brass training next week in East Alton, Illinois. Tomorrow registration for that event closes. Uh, so if you are a Service Center CAPSA member employee and you would like to attend that event, um, they have, they're have they really going to put on a, f a fabulous event for you um, on Tuesday evening for people who are traveling in the night before. There's going to be a networking reception um, followed by a dinner, uh, which we've never done a formal dinner before at this event. Um, so we are going to have a dinner for everyone in attendance. And then Wednesday morning we'll have um, breakfast at the hotel and then we will carpool over to um, the mill and do... Uh, the training and, and the tour and such at that time. So um, it's very affordable. It's $200 registration fee. Um, again, open to CAPSA Service Center members only. Uh, so if you're interested, please go to um, copper-brass.org to uh, get more information and to register for that. Um, so again, thank you, Jim. Thank you, ABC Metals, for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, You'll be receiving an email here in about an hour to complete the survey. Please do so. You'll also get a copy of the slides as well. So you um, can share those with anyone who wasn't able to make on the call. And you'll also have a recorded version of the webinar as well. So, Jim, thank you. And until next time, uh, have a good day, everyone. All right. Goodbye.